Welcome to Complimentary Colors. My name is Kara Rood, and I am joined by Melissa Pribble. Hello. And Casey Key. Hi, hello. And today we are talking about artificial intelligence in design. AI from this point forward. Uh, <laughs> when patterns are broken, new worlds emerge. I'm going to let that soak for a second. Uh, just to kind of kick us off, just because I, you know, me personally, it's always a balance between helpful or is that very scary of an advancement? So I just want to talk about maybe why we are uh, a little precautious about AI. And first, you know, I, I remember in college, like the first movie that came out about AI, it was like, oh my gosh, it's like the real apocalypse. This is how the world is going to end. I'm sorry. What about the Jetsons? Okay, you're right. I always wanted to take the pill in the morning and be like, <laughs> my toast is burnt. And have the closet of rotating clothes. Okay. All right. There's points there. But yeah, but they had a robot. I don't know if that's necessarily that's true, that's AI true, as true. we're understanding it now. Their robot nanny was legit. She was I mean, amazing. she, yeah, she could have been our type three we'll talk about later. <laughs> Getting ahead of ourselves. Um, but I did just want to set the landscape a little bit for humanity. So the first automation automation in design was the printing press. And so we're talking the 1400s. Um, and then we continued to progress. 1800s, we started to see skyscrapers. And then, you know, 2000 to 2020. So, you know, we're not, we're not, we're talking 20 years, not 200 year leaps, all of a sudden we went from zero AI to in that time frame of 20 years, it's grown 200%. Hmm. So, um, I mean, we carry around robots in our pocket constantly. We all joke about the FBI agent listening on our phone. Or just <laughs> the <Joke>. Instagram ad, <laughs> you yeah. know, or Instagram okay listening to us. Oh, <laughs> right. So... You know, it was, it's interesting because when you start to move that advancement into design, I found that, you know, in that era, the photography was also something that could be relatable at this time frame to interior design. When photography came around, you know, artists were fearful. They were like, okay, now we're all going to be out of jobs. But, you know, art is really the thing, the only thing I could think of that can survive death because it will always reinvent. So we started to get impressionism and cubism and art found a way. And so I personally think that, you know, we will reinvent. So I have just some questions. You know, I wanna hear if you guys are fearful for what AI could do in design or if you're hopeful. Um, but so my first question to you is, do you think we will use our new tools for more creative space? I'll let you answer that one, Casey. For more creative space? Yeah. Uh, it's. I have such a dichotomy between the optimist in my brain and the pessimist. And one of those things that like is the pessimist in me is seeing things on the internet because the internet is vast and full and there's all kinds of things. But if you look on, I followed like this one account on LinkedIn of all places hmm. and they show AI in design specifically. And they basically just kind of plug in prompts and show beautiful renderings that AI created. And whenever I look at these spaces, I judge it so hardcore, probably <laughs> because I know it's AI. That's wrong. But, it's out of place. Yeah. But it, it's also, it's not that it's, it's bad. It's like too much because mm. AI doesn't know how to redact because human, like human judgment is very unique to our species. And the fact that we self-regulate and we self like redact is something that AI has not yet learned to do. So you look at a space and it's probably like hyper opulent. There's tons of greenery. It's like you could never actually build the space that, that it's created because it's like not able to self-regulate its own creativity yet. Mm. Yet. and But then the op optimist in me is like, okay, but where is that really helpful to help us like push the boundaries of, well, I really like that opulence and I really like that idea of not redacting. Mm -hmm. And so it's, maximism. it's I know, maxim maximalism, maxim maximism, some mm -hmm. one of those two things, it's a huge thing. So it's it's a war in my brain right now. Oh, I war. haven't decided. You're in battle. I am, well, constant. Well, Melissa, do you think, because <laughs> part of that is like, you know, I think just to follow the tangent just for a little bit, I think about, when I used to watch TV as a child and commercials, right? That pause of that moment just freed up space. Like, 
go get a snack, do something in between. <laughs> and now I've noticed now in this new land of streaming, I get so frustrated, even like if it's buffering, you know, <laughs> and I'm like, I can't even handle a buffer. So it's almost <laughs> like with technology advancing, I have, instead of like using a pause or, oh my gosh, we're so much more efficient. We have more space. I've become more impatient. So do you think we will just become um, like the timeline of when design should be created will shorten? Or do you think we'll use these new tools to create more time for exploration? Uh, that's a good question. So I, I am hopeful that we can use the tools together to make more space to be human. And what I mean by that is yeah. that AI is not human. We are. But yet we do so many things on our full overflowing plates every day that is collecting data. It's analyzing data. Mm -hmm. It's putting this together, putting that together. All because that one person may or may not trust my design choice. Mm. So now I have to do all of this research to back up why I innately gravitate towards this answer. Yeah. So I really hope that AI helps us with the tools to allow us to get to those answers faster and in a more human approached way instead of just crunching all of this stuff just to prove. Right. <laughs> well, our, and our first like choices, Almost right? like humans are the filter to generative design. Exactly. Well, and to jump off of that, one of the more optimistic views of AI that I've heard is basically like all those, those middlemen jobs that people don't really like, like... Oh, the the parsing through numbers, the sitting and doing kind of the brain numbing things, all of those will go away because you can type it into an AI machine. It can do all the calculations for you. And all mm -hmm. of a sudden you're freed up to do something you might actually enjoy, which you'd be like, exactly. oh, no, we're losing jobs. But at the same time, that came about when we had, you know, the Industrial Revolution. Jobs were lost, but mm -hmm. new jobs are created. So, like, what new jobs will come out of this is also very optimistic, even if we have to say goodbye to things that we've always known that we're going to have an accountant. Well, what if we don't have an accountant someday? What is that person going to go do? Right. Because is it a more creative so, field? Yeah. Then? And do you think our the field of creativity or... Is the, all that's left in a way. So that we'll have to use those human instincts. Because I'm wondering, kind of like the internet, you know, too, because I guess that's the basis of all the data that it's uh, grabbing from, but the whole garbage in, garbage out. So we're just so fascinated with feeding it information currently. These machines, you know, like Chat GBT or, you know, there's the ones for pure images. There's like all these different ones that are getting the most play, so the most data input. When is that going to be filtered out? You know, like mm -hmm. when is it like going to be no only give it accurate? I think that's the new job. You think? I do. I think that what AI also can't do other than right now. Let's just put a little caveat. Current now, AI <laughs> cannot be the same in humans creativity. They can't have the imagination that we have and also our strategy. And I say that because I think that in a world where we have so many limitless options, we still can gravitate towards like the limitless ways that it could go wrong or right. That's just embedded in our subconscious, mm -hmm. <laughs> whether we want to filter that or not uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. So I think that if um, we find strategists and we like rebranding them instead of an accountant, it's an accounting strategist mm. that knows the right input to put in to get the right output or the better output. So instead of garbage in, garbage out, we're testing. They right. know they've gone to school mm. to understand the why behind it, the to goals, keep it a tool. the strategy of it. Well, and beyond that, humans have, or one of the only mammalian species that have a established morality there are mm -hmm. obviously rules and prides mm -hmm. and packs and everything within animal you know, mammalian, you know, history. You look at primates, there are rules within family groups, but we have such an established idea of what quote unquote morality is that changes mm -hmm. from culture to culture that these strategists would also be able to help guide things like um, making sure that things are fair and just and right versus just saying, well, obviously AI said that we should spend X amount of money. It was like, <laughs> well, sure, X amount of money would be nice to spend, but maybe we should like redact that a little bit so that we're making sure our employees like us, you know, sort yeah. of like. <laughs> Which begs the question, who feeds, because I'm about to give you guys the four 
by f the Forbes categories. So this is just like one way to categorize four Lay types of us. AI. <laughs> but I'm, you know, all of these need data in to even be created. Exactly. So the last two, I'm just interested. Um, so I do want just a first gut reaction once I describe each one, if it's scary or helpful, or if you want to give me a percentage of each. <laughs> so uh, the first category of AI currently is called reactive machines. So they cannot learn, they could just react to data. So that is like spam filters or Netflix recommendation engines. So they just basically the same thing we were just talking about with Instagram. You know, they hear keywords and then they filter in you know, key preferences. I would say 10% scary, 90% helpful. Okay. I agree. I mean, it's definitely way more helpful. I think the decision fatigue that I relieve myself from, especially on like the Netflix. Mm -hmm. um, but on the 10% side, it's always <laughs> interesting when you've got the clients at work and you're Googling top secret shredders. <laughs> and you're yeah. like, hmm, I wonder what the government thinks that I'm going to be doing. Yeah, right. <laughs> or, or just the idea shares. of permission <laughs> of like, did I give per Instagram permission to listen to that conversation? Like, or did, did I give Google that? <laughs> I, exactly. But you did, but you didn't. Right. You didn't but realize. Did we you all did. D decide that we only wanted to hear our own preference because. I mean, we just treat, to yeah. make this podcast 20 minutes longer. I mean, what if I just said the word political? Ooh. politics like it's called a bubble now all mm -hmm. of a sudden we see like it could actually be 90 percent scary 10 yeah, percent helpful because then you're only seeing what you well, actually echo chamber. put in yeah echo chamber there that, was that was funny there was one thing i saw about playlists before i want to hear kara's percentages but there was one thing i saw about playlists and how spotify is actually hurting the music industry in some ways mm. because when you get into an echo chamber of your own personal preference even when it comes to music Normally, you know, you can set it up and have like your discover, but it's going to go off of those things that you like mm -hmm. for sure. So if you liked one indie pop song, it's going to keep feeding you indie pop songs. And all of a sudden, all you're listening to is indie pop songs. And really, maybe you would actually enjoy a heavy metal rocker from Norway, but like you would never get a chance to hear that <laughs> right. unless you go searching for it. Mm -hmm. So it's in the like most redacted, simple, innocent way. Sometimes those customized, amazing playlists get you in a rabbit hole of your own like echo and you become a little bit of a bigot against that heavy rocker from Norway. <laughs> right. And I guess there are search engines that aren't the Googles of the mm -hmm. world, but other search engines that keep you free from preference. So they make you autonomous so that you can make sure that you get the random views or, you know, you can start to maybe keep your, your web of um, political views <laughs> wider. So, sure. Um, but with that, only because I brought it up, that is why I'm 90-10, because I, the polarity that is being created mm -hmm. with giving us exactly what we want all the time. And I talked a lot, you know, after the run this weekend, I, we've talked a lot about like, you know, the culture of comfort, you know, and how I just, I find that very scary for humanity, like this, this comfort. So it's funny that that scares me more than the other ones. <laughs> uh, so the second type is the limited memory machines. So it can learn and adapt uh, like a self-driving car. I'm 50-50 on that one. Because I think that if used in the right way, it can unlock a lot of good things. Right? It does have a little bit of creepiness to it because it's learning how to do something that a human has done for ever since the car was invented. Mm -hmm. um, ever since a horse was ridden. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, there is an evolution to it. And I think that the biggest part of people getting scared of something is because it's evolving so quickly. Um, I know self-driving cars, I'll bring it back to Jetsons. Right, right? that like, is it. It has been talked about and shown in movies. Like, it's been there. Someone imagined it. Someone envisioned it. But it hasn't been real. So we've been living in a movie with mm -hmm. all of those things. And now that it's in your face, you're like, mm, um, am I okay? What's a roller coaster? <laughs> right, a roller exactly. coaster is a self-driving car that we trust for amusement. Yep. Like, it's like, granted, it's on a track. Yeah. But, you know, so it's, it's something that, I mean, since the first person decided that a Ferris wheel would be a fun idea, like, you're, it's a something you ride that is automated. And we've had a lot of faith in that for many years. So is it another An form airplane? of... Airplane. Airplane. 
Well, yeah, airplanes. Uh, like, right. I know that I just autopilot. Had, I was just going to we That was another conversation this weekend. <laughs> it was like, how many people that you know that are pilots actually land their own planes? So side you know, story about my dad. Let's do it. <laughs> we love my dad. Uh, he used to be a pilot for the Air Force, but he would take the autopilot off uh, when it came to landing his plane for the military. And it was very funny because some of the young bucks were like, well, you don't have to do that. Like it, it does a good job for you. And, <laughs> and they were basically like, okay, old man, like you don't have to prove anything. And my dad's like, no, I do. And he would land it perfectly. And they would all be like, oh, the old man's got skills. Like, <laughs> <laughs> and it was very yeah. funny, but it's one of the, we trust automation, but when it's suddenly when it's in front of you and you are the one flipping it on or off rather than someone else flipping the switch, it becomes a lot more scary. Yeah. You have control. You're, mm-hmm. you're letting the control go to someone else. So yeah. with that control of, you know, uh, and this feeds in, in my mind to the polarity that we're, we're starting to get in the isolation because of the polarity of, you know, let's say citizens of humanity, you know, mm-hmm. I won't even put it on America, even though obviously that's, um, where I'm seeing most of these examples, but mm-hmm. so theory of mind T O M Uh, with a little O, if you ever see that referred to anywhere. (laughs) Um, It's in development, but that is uh, AI that can read emotions. So TOM works on developing human emotions such as empathy, moral judgment, and self-consciousness. So what I thought of first when I heard this, I was like, the movie Her. Totally. Terrifying. And 100% then, terrifying. Don't want it. Don't need it. Destroy it. Burn it with fire. Whatever you want. But, Liz, I mean, how far are we away from people becoming almost robotic in their choices with, like, choosing separate personalities and physical preferences in things like the metaverse, oh, it's already happening. Right. There, so in are, Japan, this gentleman married a character from the like. From stop a, it. He did. He married legally a character from a manga like series that had been generated by AI to interact with him, and he married her. I just want to point out that the fact that it was legal is oh, where the problem. Really well, stopped. how many people will give it? I'm not even going to say twenty. Give it five more years. The, the dwelling of meta versus the dwelling of physical. Mm. There is going to start to become a, you know, the polarity is, with choice, polarity is becoming just, I think, our the biggest enemy of empathy in humanity, mm-hmm. you know? Because it's like, if you don't like it, you don't need to understand it anymore. You can just segregate yourself from it. In your little bubble. Yeah. So sorry. I In your know. echo chamber <laughs> with your AI empathy, you're going to think that you're right. And it doesn't introduce any sort of contrast. Yeah. Or conflict. Yeah. Like we're starting to avoid conflict. So what do you think, Melissa? Okay, I'll, I'll lean in on the other side because I can't say I don't agree with you. <laughs> <laughs> Got to be devil's advocate. <laughs> However, um, there is some good potential roots for especially like the empathy. And I see it um, potentially giving us some really good tools for behavioral health, mm. especially when it comes to spaces and designing spaces. Um, if we have you know calm rooms and we have... ICUs and we have all these places where we're leaning on people that are exhausted <laughs> might be in short supply. Mm-hmm. I'm thinking prisons, right? Right. What There's if already... there was like AI that could sense your vitals and sense exactly. that your heart rate started to elevate and then change the physical traits of the room you were in to help your yeah. anxiety? Because we already are at a workforce shortage mm. for that type of high empathy type roles. So if we can balance that out to give them tools that have more to do with the mind, (laughs) then I think we'll make some more advances in that, that sector. Not saying that's not creepy, but I'm just saying that that's a a silver lining. Yeah. I love that actually. AI is teachers. And I mean, yeah, that I could, you know, I, you're switching my mind. (laughs) I like that. Well, that's good. The last one, uh, not in development, like theory of mind is so, but where the trend is headed, it's called self-awareness. So they have a creative mind and they could also create own emotion. So, um, you know, it's almost like the end of that movie, her, you know, where it was like, I now can create my own emotion. I can make my own, you know, universes. I could, you know, it's like the AI outgrew 
the man. It's what is that other Ultron. TV show? The, the well, HBO oh. one where they create a world where you can go and do anything that you want to do because it's an amusement park, quote unquote, but they're making intelligent AI characters and then, spoiler alert, the characters take over. I It sounds familiar. <laughs> it does. I'm going to have to. I'm, it'll yeah. come to me. It'll Are either of you Marvel indulgent humans like do you guys watch marvel movies i love marvel movies have you seen like the age of ultron like, yes okay so you haven't you give me no, a blank it's okay. look <laughs> crickets over here continue on so, i mean comic book people are have some of the most creative minds of i think in our current culture because they are pushing the boundaries on all the things that have been since comic books were a thing or graphic novels were a thing you see it in manga you see it in uh, anime like it's you, they are pushing the boundaries in ways that people don't normally think to do it. And sometimes it's full on creepy, but age of Ultron is a very well-known series and they create AI. That is exactly what it's talking about. It's a moral based, um, able to create within their own self. It's, it's a fake human in a, in a nutshell. And what happens is this character Ultron basically decides that he knows right and that humans are fallen and fallible and where he has the collective knowledge of the entirety of humanity to base off of so he alone knows what's right and wrong so he puts himself as a demigod basically and then they have to create his antithesis using the same technology using the same like to base. control it yeah. or balance it yes to, so it's like if you want to get religious on it, it's the satan character versus the jesus character <laughs> because you know, he decided that he knows, knows best and he needs his balance, his antithesis to bring him to like an equal librium. Mm -hmm. So, and I guess when I see that, you know, this, the question of scary versus helpful, it's, it's so easy for me even to personally flip flop back and forth, sure. you know, to find that balance. Um, and I guess one of the things that became like the balance of, because it was more fear at first, I started to research more dematerialization to become better efficient and sustainable so and it all looked very biomimicry driven so airbus and nasa mm -hmm. have used ai in a generative design fashion where they will take a part that maybe used to be one piece of sheet metal and they have you know generated so many design options with all of the data and you know protocol that it needed whether it was just in our airspace or in you know, the atmosphere's space just to redact down. And they start to look very web-like, like very much like branches in a tree. Mm -hmm. And so then you're like, oh my gosh, you know, less raw material. You know, we're smarter with our, with all of our technology. And so it's almost like if it's used in my mind as this machine that does all the data crunching, we can you know, almost go back to the roots of biomimicry through it. Absolutely. I just get the, if you were to ask me scared or not, mm -hmm. I'd be hundred percent scared shitless of artificial general intelligence. Ditto. Like the one that comes after this. The, yeah. Like, yeah. especially when like the head of open AI is pushing for regulation on his own product. I mean that he's like, I, <laughs> you see the writing scary. on the wall <laughs> and, I mean, sci-fi writers throughout yeah, history. I mean, right. th throughout that modernity, would say. Take over. Yeah, yeah, it's it's robots take over the world. Vending machines take over the world, depending on. You know, <laughs> vending machines. <laughs> that was an inside joke. <laughs> uh, but it's one of those things that, like, you everything throughout humanity, everything in moderation, and basically the like humans be putting a cap on it is good and healthy and right. But anything where humans are like, no, let's just explore every possible entity that this could fit into our life normally goes south. I mean, do you think the ball is rolling too fast at this point? Absolutely. Oh, 100%. If the creators are saying they need regulation, they're it's not going to stop one-upping each other, right? I that is our world. Like, you know what I, I think about when I think about that? And I help me, please. What is it? Hunger Games? <laughs> you know, when they divide into these, like, cultures, mm -hmm. like, like, hyper tech or like, the, you know, and it's like, I feel like I'm going to be, you know, the one that was like, uh, we sew our own clothes and we're out yeah. in the wilderness <laughs> completely <Is that> disconnected. <laughs> I think you're thinking more divergent. She's going more divergent than hunger games. Fact checker. Yeah. I mean, good. Do okay, it. But these 
Yeah. These amazing cultural phenomenons are all discussing what happens like after something terrible happens and are we on our way to something terrible due to AI? Right. Who knows? Well, or I just think is it the best thing ever. I agree 100% Kara when you're saying like you know, taking this and learning more about biomimicry and how we can take tools that are innately already here and apply them in the built environment. Mm -hmm. That is like where we need to go. It Absolutely. can solve so many problems. Mm -hmm. We have so much data out there that hasn't been analyzed with like human health and wellness, um, the mental health that I was talking about, but none of that needs human emotion. Right. To do. It's almost like, like <laughs> we've taken it like the limited memory machine. We've taken it far enough because I think about it and I'm like, what if shopping instead of a raw material being produced and put on a shelf or, you know, put in an Amazon list for us to choose from? What if that looked like con no raw materiality, but we were so hyper connected with that data that we could find the reuse of something else? And it was this constant we're back into trading, mm -hmm. you know, it's trading like updated of updated theory of a thrift store. Yes. Yeah. Or just like <laughs> Where can I take chains? this to recycle it well, properly? Right. Like and shoes, clothes, all of that stuff, not just the plastics and the tin and the aluminum. I want to know where to take my desk. I want to know where to put my car, the tires when they're done. Like mm -hmm. all the stuff that I have such heartburn taking to the landfill because mm -hmm. there's nowhere else here in Alaska plug uh <laughs> to take any of this Someone stuff sponsor alaska seriously we need glass um, recycling. it just it breaks my heart because i know that it could have another life because it's made of things that could could be right but why can't we use ai to figure out what else it could be right mm -hmm. that those shoes actually are a gym floor exactly mm -hmm. you know and i know i agree and we're just you know better trend prediction mm -hmm. like and that i think as much as the fashion industry has been put on blast about that you know like the 50 cent clothes you know, that Fast feed fashion. just this like whole inequality in like, you know, social economics, mm -hmm. but then also just in our landfills and all the poly products that are produced, you know, it's, it would be crazy to have it predict trends even in our industry, mm -hmm. right? So we're not put on blast yet, but eventually. Well, to like bring it back more to design as, as you're kind of drawing us closer to home, Kara, you are lead certified and you have this amazing task and ability to go into a space and to check all the boxes and to say, you know, with my human intelligence, with my training, that I can go in and give you a certification that lets people know how hard we worked to give you this building that's perfect. What if you had a handheld scanner powered by AI? You could just like scan it around the building. AI says, yep, all these boxes are checked. And then all of a sudden they have a lead certification. How many more people Ooh. would be willing to get a lead building? The tool. Because mm -hmm. you are able to give them a certification and you still need to check it because you still have the training, but you've taken the time to regulate it and make it more accessible. So there's goodness to mm -hmm. tools when using it as tools rather than using it as morality. That's a good example because LEAD is all about data input mm -hmm. and analytics, everything we don't like doing. <laughs> right. So I'm going to bring it just maybe in closing um, to lead into maybe the next topic that we hit on a podcast, but um, how desire plays into that. Because mm. you know how people are like, uh, there's jokes about it, you know, like uh, shopping therapy, you know, like <laughs> retail therapy. Yeah. Mm. All right. You know, that consumerism, <laughs> you know, um, there is some level of addiction to AI. And I saw it so prevalently with filters, you know, mm -hmm. like all of a sudden when all the filters came out, I mean, it could be to mask things you don't like, but then it could also just be jokey and fun. It's like just to um, have that metamorphic moment mm -hmm. has become entertainment, but then it also has created this like desire, you know, to mm -hmm. go forward. Like that ball is picking up momentum down that mountain. I don't know why I see this like boulder going after a stick figure. <laughs> Snowball but, that gets bigger yeah, and right. yeah. You know, and so I'm wondering, you know, if we are aware, but our desire is greater than our awareness, like where is hum where do you think is that stopping point? Do you think it's an apocalyptic moment where you were just said vending machines take over? Or <laughs> you know, like what is the moment where you think the fear of losing control of humanity having their hand on the on off button versus the kind of addiction through desire mm -hmm. that we have created with all of these like fascinations? That's very, very good question. 
I have to, the, one of the first thoughts I'll have to, I have to just jump off of it. So with filters, like whether it's, um, for a selfie <laughs> or just a photograph in general, um, I have to say that it also increases somebody's perspective and art of an artistic look at something, right? Making something um, more pleasing or just different. So it's giving those that maybe don't flex those creative muscles at all um, the ability to see what it could do if you looked at something a little mm. differently. Have a tool. Um, mm. However, there is a balance of what's real and what's not real, right? Mm. And I think you hinted towards that. And I think that you always say that that innate ability to just go back to nature, we have to listen to that. Like mm. there's a natural beauty in something. There is a perfection beauty, but nothing's perfect, right? So we have to embrace the imperfections. And I think that some of those creative outlets are showing that, like the funny, the, you know, let's try this and make like the art in the corner of just having a TV on somebody's head. Mm -hmm. Like there's, there's a reason that they did that. Mm -hmm. So I think that the ability to like play with those is a good thing. I don't know. So, Casey, what do you think? Oh, I have some deep thoughts. <laughs> I'm going to try to redact because I have lots going on. Um, <laughs> but I think to put it plainly, there's nothing new under the sun that there is and always will be humans pushing the boundaries and doing something to excess Yes. You look at any empire in history, you look at the Roman Empire, you look at the Ottoman Empire, you look at the British Empire, like you look at like the fact that all of these empires, you can look at Incas and and Egyptians and like they have had societies that rose and fell long before us. And normally the fall of every single society is because they got too decadent and too greedy and too obsessed with self. And at the end of the day, if we let AI be that version of that decadence and that version it's of... It's going to go to perfection. Exactly. So you. it's it's the... Uh, if we put a cap on it and if we say it will go thus far and no further, we're fine. We have the ability to treat it just like another industrial revolution, just like in the 2000s when everyone thought that the world was going to end because the internet was here and it was going to roll over 2000 who knew what was going to happen the flood was going to take over the world i Whatever. completely agree i think that where we're at right now with ai we need to hold on to and grasp and exactly. start developing these new um jobs like a whole nother sector Kara said it so perfectly you're like it needs to be a tool yeah absolutely tools and tools that create more jobs there we go. not eliminate them I love it. Thank what do you, you think? Guys. No, I'll hold on. We you need to hear what you say. <laughs> Come on now. I would say that um, I would hope that our search for like new or in our search for understanding that mm. tool of AI, we just said that we're going to cap it there and no more, that we would dive deeper into things that are um, very primal to us, like mm. understanding natural systems more and understanding what our drive is, you know? And so I think... Um, I think you said it beautifully, but if we could, if we could just uh, all give a plug, you know, are we scared or are we feeling hopeful? Um, I would just like to to wrap that up, just like around around the to the three of us. I would just say I am feeling hopeful after this because um, I do feel like the connectivity provided to us. We are all listening to each other, and we are all, you know, there's so many options out there that. You know we're gonna we're gonna learn our limits. Hmm. Anybody else? I'm hopeful. Hopeful for that ethics and moral part to kick in for I, sure. <laughs> I think I'm still deeply pessimistic with a twinkle of hopefulness. A light <laughs> a twinkle. Twinkle. Just a twinkle. All right. <laughs> well, with that twinkle, we will <laughs> we will sign off this podcast. Thank you for joining us today, um, and uh, look forward to having you again. Yes, absolutely. Stay tuned. Compliment to Colors is a production of MCG Explore Design, an architecture and interior design firm located in beautiful Anchorage, Alaska. If you'd like to hear more future episodes, be sure to subscribe to Complimentary Colors wherever you find podcasts.